Hello and welcome to the Eastman's Predator Pros podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Nimnick, and we are back, and it's August. We've almost made it through summer. Uh, if you're anything like me, man, you're starting to get pumped up now, um, if you're a seasonal coyote hunter anyway. Uh, but, uh, you know, I finished up my baseball stuff here the other night, uh, you know, had a great season, traveled around with my boys, coaching, uh, watching them play. Uh, it's been hot, I can tell you that. You know, I think we've had, uh, I don't know, five or six days in the hundreds here just in the last few weeks. So I am already looking forward to some cooler fall days coming up. But, uh, you know, started the planning process, you know, usually once baseball gets done and I start switching gears, um, it's it's like full go now. Um, you know, August is the month where I'll start planning um, all of our last stand trips, uh, locations where we'll be filming this upcoming season. Uh, putting together dates for upcoming coyote uh, craze college classes that I'll be putting on here in Nebraska this season. Um, so yeah, everything there, you know, and if you're listening to this and you're, and you're wanting to jump on one of my in-person coyote schools, um, I'll be releasing those dates here about the third week of August. So um, jump onto my website, which is coyotecraze.com. Uh, there'll be a newsletter section right there on the very front of the homepage. Just subscribe to that. All you gotta do is enter your email, hit it, and then once I release those dates, the the morning I release those, I'll send out an email blast to everybody on that list and say, hey, dates are up now. Um, at that point, they're first come, first serve, you know. I don't know exactly how many class dates I'm going to have this year. Uh, probably at least six or seven. So we're probably looking at somewhere in 20, 21 spots. Um, my guess is they're going to probably sell out in a couple hours. So if you're not on that list, if you're not ready, unfortunately, you're probably not going to get one. Um, but... Uh, but if you are wanting to try to snag up one of those spots, uh, like I said, go over to my website, which is coyotecraze.com, uh, subscribe to that newsletter, and then you'll at least get a notification when those come out. But as, as mentioned in the previous podcast, I had some information, exciting news, uh, some stuff we've been working on. So, and it's in line with my in-person coyote school. So, um, I still can't say a lot yet, um, but I can tell you this, if you miss out on my in-person coyote schools, there will be options for you. Um, if that gives you an indication of what's coming out, uh, you know, there's going to be an online coyote school to break the news to you. So that's going to be launching in September at some point. Um, we've been working on this now since last, last season, uh, last fall, actually. Um, a lot of work and effort's been going to this, you know, from the team. I'm partnering up with Lucky Duck. You know, it's going to be built around the last stand. Um, so, so yeah, stay tuned from this. I'm super excited. Um, essentially everything that, that I talk about and teach in my online or my in-person schools is, is going to be accessible to you through your phone, your computer and whatnot. So, uh, I'm going to leave you with that. I think by the time the next podcast comes out, maybe the two from now, I'll be able to really give you a detailed run at what this is going to consist of. But, um, I'm telling you what, uh, it, it's going to be a game changer for a lot of you guys out there especially you guys that don't have a lot of time to go hunt on your own. Um, and hopefully, you know, you get a little taste, whether it's listening to these podcasts, uh, watching the last stand episodes, just gives you a little taste of, of what you're going to learn. Um, you know, that's a very tip of the spear um, when it comes to teaching coyote hunting based off of what you're going to find in this online school. Um, just off the top of my head, I think there's eh, maybe seven and a half, eight hours of instructional content videos and things like that on this website alone, plus some other really cool features that I'll talk about down the road. So anyway, stay tuned. Um, super excited to get this to you guys, um, get that out, but we'll talk about that uh, coming up here on a, on a future podcast. But on this podcast, got a friend of mine, his name is Andrew Lawand. Um, If you've been around the coyote world, if you've got uh, subscriptions to Predator Extreme Magazine, you've probably read some of his articles before. Um, Andrew lives in uh, in New York State. Um, just a, a crazy coyote hunting fanatic out there. He's traveled around, got to hunt uh, out West here quite a bit. Um, but, uh, anyway, I, I actually was on the phone with him the other day. He was doing some research and, and wanting some of my opinions on some things for a future coyote article too. He was working on, um, and then I thought, you know what, it'd be fun to have you on the podcast and uh, we can talk about his, uh, you know, history, how he got started in writing, especially for some of these publications and, and some of the books that he's written, um, on coyote hunting. Um, so yeah, and some of just his Eastern coyote hunting stories as well. So it should be fun. Andrew's quite the character. Um, 
Uh, so it's going to be a fun one. But before we jump in to the podcast, I need to thank the sponsors of this episode, which are Hornady and Lucky Duck. Now, a few episodes back, I had the guys from Hornady on, and we talked about this new 22 arc. And I've gotten a few questions on, on social media since then about what am I doing? Well, I can tell you this. I jumped in headfirst on the 22 arc. Um, here over the summer, I sent my my 223 rifles in my day gun and my night gun, and I had them converted over to 22 arc. So I am going all in on the 22 arc. Um, yeah, I will still have a couple 223 sitting in the gun safe, but my guns that I will shoot, my day gun and my night gun, will both be 22 arcs. I'm going to be shooting the 62 grain ELDVT um, exclusively at Coyotes this season. So I'm super excited. I haven't quite got my rifles back yet. Um, the guys down at GA Precision were switching those over for me. New barrels, new gas blocks, uh, bolt faces, everything that you need to do to convert a, you know, that the AR-15 over to the, you know, in the 223 over to the 22 arc, which, you know, wasn't a, as extensive as I, I really thought. So I'm excited. It should have those back here in the next couple of weeks. Um, I'm going to start shooting them, getting things dialed in, you know, because, uh, you know, the season will be here before I know it. So this season on the last stand, you're going to see me shooting the 22 arc. I'll be talking about it. Um, I'm just excited. It's, it's been a big, you know, a long road, you know, um, 20 years shooting the 223. I mean, I've shot a 223 exclusive, so it's a big, a big step for me. Um, hopefully you can teach an old dog new tricks. So I'm hoping this is going to be everything I think it's going to be. Um, but yeah, you know, Hornady, that 62 grain ELDVT, I think that bullet's really going to be something special from what everything I've read on it, heard from guys that have already been shooting it at coyotes. Um, they say it's exceptional. So I'm excited about that. So yeah. Um, you know, if you're in the market, maybe looking at doing that, maybe, you know, I think even out of my six Creed more, um, I'm going to be up calling wolves, uh, in Canada later this fall. And I'm going to take a six Creed more up. And I think I'm going to shoot that, uh, you know, off the top of my head, I don't know if it's probably going to say it wrong. 80 grain ELDVT out of the six Creed more, maybe 75. It's somewhere in that ballpark. I'm going to shoot that same bullet out of that six Creed more. Um, hopefully I get to uh, put one through a wolf and see what it does. Um, but uh, that's a whole, whole nother topic there that we can get into. So yeah, if you're wanting to check out this new, this new ELDVT line of bullets that Hornady offers, it's, it's pretty exceptional. Uh, just go look at the picture. That's all you have to do. Really. If you know anything about bullets, just go look at the dissected picture of what this ELDVT bullet looks like, and you'll say, "Oh yeah, that's that's going to do what I want want it to do on coyotes for sure." So, so yeah, head over to their website now. Also, got to thank Lucky Duck. Um, you know, excited for this season. Um, you know, there's going to be some new stuff coming out. Um, this season's going to be, you know, product wise, you're probably not going to see any new line of calls coming out, but we're actually you know, Rick Pellett, myself will be working with them. Uh, there's going to be some stuff coming out for the following season that we'll be testing and things like that. So excited for that. Um, new technology, um, new features, new things like that. So that's always fun. But, you know, as a matter of fact, I pulled into my garage the other day and I saw my, my Super Revolt, my Revolt sitting up on my shelf right there. And they a little dust built up on them, you know, so it won't be too much longer and I'll be breaking that stuff out. Uh, you know, getting batteries charged and, uh, you know, probably talking to Rick, see what he's got for some new sounds. He always likes to send me his new sounds um, every year about, uh, you know, this time he starts launching, you know, his 2024 sound library, uh, his Rick's killers and things like that. Um, so, so yeah, that'll be exciting. But, you know, if you're looking to upgrade your call, um, looking for something maybe a little bit different, looking to add some sounds to your call, uh, maybe looking to add that lithium at battery pack to your call that you never had maybe just keep investing a little bit of money in your equipment you know um head on over to their website which is luckyduck.com and you can see uh, that full line of of e-calls that they offer well andrew welcome to the podcast man ah, thanks for having me i'm doing a beautiful summer's day in new york i take it actually it is a very nice day i'm looking out the uh, window right now the, the bay is flat my son just got off the jet ski and I guess when we're done talking about coyotes, which is never a bad thing, I'll probably jump on that jet ski myself. Well, you, you mentioned it. It is summer, so there's probably not much coyote killing to do right now. So jet skiing is probably the second most fun thing, you know. Well, yeah, because I'm in New York State, and we do have a, a season for fox and coyote. So we cannot hunt coyotes here until October 1st. 
and it goes all the way through the end of March. So we hit it hard then, and I'm talking yeah, every yeah. day and night for myself. But in the summer, it's it's an off season. Usually, I like to travel in September out to South Dakota and sort of try out some new new sounds and such out there yeah, on yeah. that trip. But oh yeah, believe me, this is fishing time and, and jet skiing time and Beach Boy concert time for me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, heck yeah! Well, no, we got a lot to talk about. You know, I've known you for for quite a few years. You know, talk. We, we've had communications back and forth over the years. Um, you know, I actually first met you at the what do they call that the world predator hunting expo i don't, I don't even know the exact name of it exactly yeah was it was out there in ohio and Columbus? somebody actually took a picture a candid picture you and i sat down at the end of one of the days and i was interviewing you for an article and somebody took a picture of us talking and i'm gonna it's in my archive somewhere i'll dig that out and share it with you that was a fun day yeah, that you know that was pretty unique. You know, I don't know if any of the listeners here were were around the coyote scene back in two thousand and ten. You and I were talking about that. We think it was two thousand and ten, right? Uh, was the year, but it was kind of a unique experience where the, the predator world was kind of blowing up a little bit at that point. You know, growing pretty fast, and um, a guy by the name of Brent Reeb decided to put this big expo together because there was all kinds of hunting expos. You know, deer and western big game and stuff like that there but wasn't really a specific predator hunting expo so he put this together i don't really know how he came up with columbus ohio was the <laughs> was the center point of all this but that's where we all ended up well it was neat remember they had the calling the world calling championships on the stage yeah. were yeah, there, yeah. You know, and a host of guys got up there i didn't do it i was promoting books at the time but uh but they were world-class callers obviously uh you know with mouth calls and such and it was a treat i actually was the the judge in one, You're of, one of the judges for yeah. that huh <laughs> yeah it was fun yeah was i mean great. it was it was unique because yeah they had the stage and i think they had the distress calling champion which was like you go up there who could make the best rabbit dying rabbit sound you know then they had the vocalizations the howling and uh you know maybe that and then i think they had a, maybe an all-around champion as well right. but you're right like you were you were one of the judges behind the curtain so you <laughs> yeah. couldn't see <laughs> it was neat yep and right <laughs> back then that's when coyote howling was at the forefront. It was just coming on being popular because before that time it was all distress. And as you mentioned, uh, rabbit distress. And then everyone figured out, oh, gee, they were coming to these howls. And that was all the rage back then. Yeah, yeah. It, well, and the guys were, were using the diaphragm calls. They kind of started doing that, you know, trying to get the more realistic coyote howls um, out of that stuff. Yeah, that was, uh, was that neat. was unique. I, I yeah. still remember, though, too, you know, last night you and I were on a phone call. Um, and you mentioned about the the whitetail expo that was right across the parking lot at yeah. the same time. And, you know, there wasn't a lot of traffic because, you know, I, I actually went there. I was in the middle of, of selling DVDs. I think I had about my second DVD out at the time. So I I had bought a booth, you know, and my whole goal was to promote that and, and things. But, uh, you know, it didn't seem like our traffic was was crazy. But I remember always looking out the door and they had the Whitetail Expo. <laughs> and there's like yeah. a line, a line clear around the building to get the into building. that. And like, <laughs> oh, I remember it too. Believe me. Why can't they come in here? But it was good. Yeah. Nonetheless, it was a success. They did it twice. They did it in Kansas and they did it in Ohio. And then it sort of went by the wayside. Was the Kansas the first one then? I want to say was, it was. I yes, think it was, it was the first one. I missed out on that first. one. And then. Yeah. 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 Yep. It was. <laughs> Back in the day, I mean, I got to meet, uh, you know, that was my first time. You know, I got to meet like Byron South, um, Randy Anderson was at that one, Les Johnson oh, yeah. was there, you know, all the Fox Pro guys were there, um, you know, Terry Denman, the Mojo guys. I mean, I just remember right. Fred Zink, you know, uh, Waterfowl oh, yeah. Call, they were, they were in the Predator market at that time making acrylic hand calls. He was there. Um, yeah, there was there were some cool dudes. Got great. to meet some guys. And yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that was the best part. And I got, and I still have it now, I probably should frame it, a picture with Jerry Blair. And I. we both had yellow really? shirts on. And that yeah. was in Kansas. And we had our arms around each other. And now, of course, he's passed away. But he was a, one of the forefathers of predator writing, outdoor writing. So yeah, for sure. he was a legend. Is a legend. Was he from, was he from Arizona? You know what? Down Somewhere that, out there. Yeah. Down it's, in the Southwest, if I remember yeah. right. Somewhere down yeah. in that country. Yeah, yeah. A true classic. You know, yeah, and a mentor yeah. for many of the, the writers today, actually. So that was, yeah, <laughs> maybe we could bring that back predator expo back. Uh, well, now it's all, then the internet took over and a lot of things are handled online. So yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was pre Facebook and all that. Can you imagine? <laughs> yeah. So you were at the expo 
marketing a book at the time, right? Or second book, predator yeah, hunting book? Yeah, yeah. I've had a sort of a neat. My whole predator uh, experience is pretty neat, and it started hunting woodchucks with my father back in 1985 in New York when a, a coyote. We were obviously in the morning going looking for woodchucks to come out, and a coyote came ripping across the field. And my dad and I just had our jaws down. My dad says, that's a coyote. He says, you can call those in, you know. I'm like, oh, well, you know, we didn't shoot it initially. And th this was before there was even a season on them back in New York because they were unheard of, essentially. And we went to Walmart that night and bought a wooden mouth call, rabbit call. Went back yeah. that afternoon, started making noise. I didn't know about cadence or volume or anything. <laughs> I was just blowing on it. And here comes a coyote, but it wasn't that big one we saw. It was a pup, and it was about the size of a cat. So we didn't we didn't shoot that coyote. We but we you know we said we can't shoot that. But that started it back in 1985. So that was that was my introduction, and been going strong hunting wise, you know, ever since. And it's been fun. But the writing came about. I used to do some writing. Writing for here's another one: the Varmint Hunters association remember yep. that it was in yep. here south dakota that's gone yep. by the wayside but that was super strong back in the day i used to write for their magazine and then uh got involved with predator extreme which is still going strong today mm -hmm. and and that's been for me a, a lot of fun to do that and just share information and of course you know read and pick up everything you can our business yeah, yeah. was very eclectic you had to take something from everywhere to you know increase your skill set so the, that's been a lot of fun for me. Yeah. Before we get into that writing side, because I, you know, I'm very interested in into hearing your background there. Okay. Tell me a little bit. So 1985, you you bought this call. You called in your essentially your first coyote. Right. When was it when you finally killed your first coyote? Okay. Well, let me. Oh well, gosh, that was <clears throat> again in New York State, and my cousin moved into this rural track, suburban area, but a rural track with a big old farm, which I still hunt today. So that was 30 years ago. Oh yeah. He goes, hey, there's all sorts of coyotes out there. Okay, so I think we took that same call into like five or six came across right in the middle of the day. You know, we didn't know about dust dawn. There was no night hunting back then. Yeah. And here they came, and I had a, a Winchester bolt action 223, and I cracked that first coyote, and that sort of lit the fire. But the fire was enhanced when I used to take the trips out west with my dad to South Dakota. And we'd go to Wyoming and Colorado all over for, for prairie dogs. But we brought the coyote stuff too. And we we're at Cabela's and we've bought a Fox Pro call. I think it was the old model. Of, uh, it was a 38, actually, a model 38 of all things. One of the old flashlight a, looking ones. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, the yeah. Of that. And, and then, you know, had fun with that because that was new. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just you know, now, of course, with the equipment, you know, it doesn't matter what brand you have. It's just that everybody's, you know, as advancing over the years and all the hunters, I mean, we've gone from, Sitting yeah. on the cushions now, these tripods and just everything, it just keeps snowballing, and that's good because it increases yeah. hunters. Yeah. I think it increases hunters' uh, confidence and enjoyment of the sport, and that's what it's really all about. So then, through because I want to get into that too, because obviously you know somebody that spends most of their time primarily hunting in in New York State and then coming out west, I you know definitely want to talk about those experiences as well. But let's jump into the writing side. Did, okay. did the writing correlate with, with your real job? No. Well, <laughs> that's funny. Or not. Or, um, or is it something might... you just enjoyed writing and kind of got into it? Or yeah, Well, that's actually a sort of a neat background, too. I was actually, by trade, I was a physical education teacher for 30 years and a coach. Coach soccer, ice hockey, lacrosse for 30 years. And it was wonderful. Yeah, okay, I might have put you for an English teacher, Andrew. Well, the thing is, <laughs> this, this is sort of funny because in English, I had a in, excuse me, in high school, I had a teacher who didn't like the way I wrote. I'm like, okay, you know, that's fair. That's what I, whatever it is. But then when I got to college, I got glowing reviews, not, you know, good grades and writing. Yeah, yeah. So I never contemplated that I would. So to get to answer your question, now I'm teaching phys ed. I'm in my you know, 20, 22 years old, whatever, teaching, coaching, getting into hunting. And as you know, Sometimes your priorities get a little askew because uh, hunting. So I don't use the word addicting. I don't like that word, but, but uh, obsessive and, and yeah. that's your passion. So I'm all into it. And again, I'm 
watching DVDs and VHS, not to date myself, but uh, blah, blah, blah. And some, some gentleman, his name was Dave Kapraki, put a book out about fox hunting. It was actually a booklet. And I ordered it because, again, we want to be a sponge and absorb everything we could. Okay? Just like guys should still do today, and I still do. Right? You're always looking to learn something new every day. So I, I read his book, and it was neat. And I said to myself, I can do this. I can write a book. So I did. But the books actually were a little bit after the articles. The articles uh, were at the forefront of that. But the books, because I've got, I would have to count, I would say published now maybe 10 or 11 books on, on Fox and Coyote. So, oh, wow. and again, yeah, well, it's neat. The, the, I just put one out actually like two weeks ago when it's doing really, really well, like above and beyond my XP. It was a neat idea, I will say, but but it's it's doing really yeah. well and guys are really enjoying it. The reviews are good. So I'm very excited actually, as I sit here on a summer day, excited about <laughs> calling coyotes here in a couple of months because of that book and because just everything, you know how it is. How did you get your start? You know, where did that relationship come about with, with the first magazine that you wrote for? That's a great question. And it's sort of a, a neat uh, memory for me. There was a gentleman who was a writer for Predator Extreme and his name was Ed Park. And I didn't know him personally, but somehow we started chatting back and forth. Uh, and I don't, I must've been by email at that point. And I had an idea for shooting. Cause again, night hunting was just getting popular, uh, back in the day, you know, way before thermal and all that it was all with lights and such. Yep. And I had an idea to uh, allow a practice technique to allow hunters to become better, more proficient at shooting at night. And the basic idea was to take yeah, uh, driveway reflectors paint put two pennies on them spray paint them black take off the pennies and now when you show on a light on those it looked looked like the eyes of a fox or a coyote <laughs> so we would go out at night and shoot at them so that's what i wrote the article about and that was fresh at the time so fresh that the editor pounced on it and made me overnight mail i'll never forget it i need this by tomorrow oh it cost me like 21 dollars overnight the a cd of the text to them Okay, now it would have been an email, but this is, hey, yeah. I'm not trying to say I'm old folks, but because <laughs> I know I feel like I'm 11. Yeah. But, but that article went out. And ever since then, I've had a nice relationship with all the editors. And, you know, some magazines have come and gone. And not now, well, of course, Predator Extreme was six times a year back then. Now it's down to four seasonally, which is fine. But I'm fortunate to be uh, featured every, in, you know, every quarter. So yeah, it's, yeah. it's been great. And the best part is meeting guys like you, you know, myself. I mean, my dad, who's passed away, would be very proud. He was always proud of the whole. He was a big Jack O'Connor fan and all that. So he was yeah. so proud of me. And for me, the best thing is the friends in the in the acquaintances I've met throughout it all. That's the best part for me. Oh, 100 percent. That's it. Yeah. You, had you, have you ever got the opportunity to go on some some different writers hunts? I'm sure you have over the years. Uh, or. <laughs> I, well, I had a couple that fell through, but I did some things here. I did some shoots for some companies and it probably shouldn't be aired right now. It was, I saw some, I saw, I sat in on a business meeting that I sort of wanted to run out of there. I don't know why it was, <laughs> that business is no longer in business. It was, it was a crazy uh, day for me, but no, I would like to at uh, time and I'm sure some will evolve it with some traveling. I do travel for the coyotes. But hey, yeah, uh, and sometimes those relate to articles, actually. Um, as we talked last night about our other project, you and I were chatting about it on an article, and one popped up. See, that's how it happens. We, yeah. it, I was just telling somebody yesterday when in writing, it's for me, it's not so much the writing, it's coming up with the idea of what to write about something fresh. Oh, I something agree. That's beautiful. That, that's what it's all about, right? I mean, yep. something that the when the reader opens up that magazine goes through it, picks out what they want to read first. When they're done with the article, if they can say to themselves, well, that was good, that was meaningful, I picked up two, three, four things, and actually, if it's only one thing that helps you kill a coyote later, then it's been a worthwhile read. That's my motto. You know, it's crazy. This kind of, everything always comes for a circle. You know, I actually got in, you know, I was, I did some article writing as well for Predator Extreme, a few other you know, not near what you have done, 
And I was always kind of like, it just always reminded me that I was in like English class, right? Like I, I was good at writing, but I didn't really enjoy it. I, I felt like it was just like a, I was just a grind every time I was writing these articles, you know, and I, was, I felt like I had these deadlines. Well, then a, an individual contacted me that was actually looking into buying out Predator Extreme magazine and asking me if I wanted to be the editor of the magazine. <laughs> and I said, I said, absolutely not. I said, I don't want anything to do with it because I don't care for, but then, and then, so that conversation turned into a podcast and I said, well, I'd love, I would oh. love to sit here and talk about this way more than have to write it all down. So, well, that's kind go. of, we found your niche. <laughs> uh, um, well, that's funny. That, that's I, asked, I asked about the writer's hunch, you know, I don't know if people listening understand, you know, sometimes a, a company will launch a new product, you know, and you'll see this a lot in, in various magazines across the hunting industry. And, and what they'll do is they'll host an event somewhere, you know, maybe it's turkeys, maybe it's deer, maybe it's waterfowl, maybe it's coyotes. And they bring writers like Andrew and other writers into this event, um, give them some product to use. They take them on a hunt and then the writers all go back and write articles, uh, you know, for these magazines. And that's, that's actually how I got in with Lucky Duck. I didn't know if you knew that okay. or not. No, no. Um, so, um, what was his, is it Mark? Was Mark one of the editors? Maybe still the yes, editor of Predator Extreme. Mark Olas. Mark yep. Olas. Yep. So, so when I was writing, you know, this is back about 2012, 14. Um, Lucky Duck was just getting ready to launch their line of e-calls. And, and they had got a hold of him because they were doing some advertising through Predator Extreme. And they basically said, hey, we uh, Lucky Duck wants to put out a writer's hunt. Can you send a writer? Well, they weren't going to pay for the, air tra the, the travel. They were only going to pay for the the lodging and the food and stuff at the hunt. So he got a hold of me and he's like, Hey, you're the closest writer I got to Kansas. Uh, do you want to run down there for this writer's hunt? And so I was like, oh, well, perfect. yeah, it's, it's with Rick Paulette and down in Kansas and blah, blah, blah. So yeah, that's, so that's, that's how I met Rick Paulette. That's oh, how I neat. met the guys. Uh, the owner of lucky duck was with us on that deal. Um, they had no clue. I was, I had really no clue what they were doing. So, you know, you never know the what you're going to stumble into. Well, I said the stepping stones in this business and this community is pretty amazing. What can happen, you know? Uh, and I, I feel fortunate with working who I, with I, who I work with. Everything's been fun, and I think that the camaraderie. I think, and this is just my view looking at it. Back early on, and again, back when we were talking back in the days of those, the uh, the get-togethers aired out in Ohio, there was a lot of competition and um, ferociousness and and bad talk and i from my viewpoint that seems to have come way down i don't even online everybody is way more friendly of a, a community i think across the board that's what i'm seeing yeah i mean yeah and i agree too i think and i don't know why that is you know it seems like there's more of an opportunity to be uh you know with able to make comments on social media and all this kind of stuff nowadays right. oh, yeah. that you think you think it would be it could potentially be worse, but I, I do agree that, right. you know, it has calmed down. I don't know if everybody's kind of realized, okay, there's room for all of us here. You know, we're all, we're all a small community the way it is right. Um, right. when yeah, it comes to predator yeah. hunters. So, you know, no sense in uh, <laughs> bashing each other and doing this. Let's just all go kill coyotes, man. Right. Well, exactly. I think that's right there. That phrase says it all. We're all on the same team and you know, more as, as predator hunters, let's go with it. And, you know, there's room for everybody. Let's just go and do it. That's the healthiest attitude. How many articles do you think you've written at this point that have been published? Oh gosh, very well, Any idea? Point. Well, hundreds, right? It's, it's, yeah, I'm not not a thousand. I'm not. I tip my hat to the outdoor writers out there who make a living doing it. And but I know how they do it. They go to many many sources, and you know they don't specialize. Like I'm strictly a fox and coyote guy. I've done some turkey things for other publications, um, but. These guys who, you know, put their kids through college and pay their mortgage and all that, I tip my hat to them. You know, uh, for me, it was always a side. My teaching profession was my bread and butter. I did this just as a teacher to disseminate information and share share the passion. Yeah. yeah. But uh, so I've done hundreds, but now it's down to, I hate to say it, like for Predator Extremes, only four a year. But uh, but it keeps me active. It yeah. gives, gives me time to get out and hunt. That's for sure. You tell the wife, yeah, I gotta go do some research for this article, honey. I gotta go hunt next couple nights. Oh you know? yeah, it's, it's, it's not easy being me, you know. Yeah, it's, yeah. I say it to her all the time. So, I mean, don't forget <laughs> the books now, because I'm the yeah. Books, that's that's what I want to hear about are these books because that's something I have always 
thought about, you know, with just what I do with my coyote schools and things like that. Um, and I knew there was a handful out there. Tell me how, you know, th how that whole process worked. Well, when again, first, first I started getting into uh, books. Yeah. I picked it up from that, from that Dave Kapraki. I hope I'm pronouncing that right with his Fox book and did a uh, coyote book. It was well received. Uh, still that was, I think that's my number. The first book is my number three seller. Um, but then just like anything, it, ideas evolve though. This will be a good book, blah, blah, blah. Oh, let's do a Fox book. Okay. Let's, you know, it, a, a nighttime book, a daytime book. And in this, that part, it, that's challenging. Like, it's hard to do a book and the formatting and the little glitches yeah, yeah. can happen. That, that, that's difficult and the photos and, and this and that and the other thing. So that's not easy, but I enjoy it. And somehow again, recently this, this month, my latest book, uh, as somebody said, I hit a home run with it. it I, the idea was good. And Jeff, what it is in case any of you boys listening yeah, doesn't know about it. The book has two focuses. It it's, it it's called coyotes by the calendar. So each month, is a chapter or each chapter is a month. Yeah. And the first part of the chapter is life cycle. What is going on in a coyote's life in the month of April, for example? Okay, that's it. And then the second part of that chapter is sequences to use during that month. Because as you know, because you see it, because you're on social media, the most popular question, no, no matter how aggravated it is, when people get out and say, what sounds are working right now? Right? That, yeah, that's so that's exactly it. <laughs> yeah. So this sounds book. Are working. That. Yeah, what's, what's working right now? <laughs> I want to go out tonight. What's working? So this book addresses that question. And we say that in jest, but it truly does. And I know a lot of guys who receive questions such as yourself. And that's probably a big thing. What's going on? What are the coyotes doing? What sound should I use? Well, it's all in this book. And <laughs> so I, I'm excited about it. Yeah, that's that's crazy. Yeah. So, Adam, you said you've written maybe ten or twelve different books. Which, yeah, what's your, uh, num yeah, what's your number one seller up to this point? Well, before this, it was the one called the Predator Hunters Playbook, which was a whole bunch of sequences. Uh, each chapter was different sequence for different scenarios, and that was a great book. It is a, it is a great book? I've updated it once, probably because you know how it is. Count, uh, sounds keep coming out. It probably could use an updating, but it's still, it still works well. That was my number one, but this, this latest one's blown them all away. It's astronomical. What's happening oh, wow. with it? That's great. Well, I don't know. Well, if that sustains itself, maybe, it, maybe if it did, I wouldn't have to be driving a 2011 rusted Chevy Silverado, but uh, we'll see. We'll, <laughs> we'll see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the, the information is big, you know, I think, Right now, in today's world of technology, guys have access to more information than ever before. You know, they have access to guys like you and me and and through social media, they can ask questions. So I think it's it's driving this. I don't know. It's like a an urge or a need to find out more because they know it's at their fingertips. Right. I mean, I whether agree 100 uh, percent. Yeah. Um, you know, online stuff nowadays seems to be big online courses, uh, whatever it may be videos youtube things like that so yeah that's yeah. it's it's cool yeah no it's great it's great for us i mean just to be able to get that knowledge and i used to think it was regional i used to think that guys in the north where i am the northeast were newer to the game of coyote honey so they were really hungry and i've seen it over the years because i don't forget i used to run that contest of course now we don't have yeah. contests in New York. so i would see the guys who were new to the sport and soaking it all up and wanting the videos and the books and the DVDs. But then over the course of the 20 years, they became the veterans of the area. So it's just it's sort of funny to to know. But I, but I get, my point is, it's just not the Northeast. There's new guys in the sport all over. At one point, predator hunting was the fastest growing sport in the, in the market, you know, the hunting industry. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know if, that, if that's still true, but certainly it's, it's becoming popular. And I think we see it on Facebook because how many times do you see this on a deer hunting site? They'll have trail cam pictures and it's coyotes. And they'll say, as soon as deer season's over, I better get out there and kill all these coyotes. Like it's going to be easy, but I, it's a new yeah, influx yeah. all the time yep. of guys. Yeah. Yeah. I will. We, we have some conversations like this too. Like there's always a new influx, but how many guys 
give it up as fast as they take it on, right? Because they realize, oh man, this isn't as easy as I thought it was going to be, right? They went and bought the calls and then they'd sell it on Facebook Marketplace, but you know, or whatever. But yeah, I I I do think we're retaining though. Um, some of those guys are just get pissed off enough where they're like, I'm giving up on this. This is this is yeah. now I'm gonna make I'm gonna I'm gonna make this happen now, you know. They right, take it right. as a challenge, no. you know. That'd be actually to get a good number on that. Maybe somebody has that number. Maybe we can put that out in a survey to see how many guys actually do drop out. Because I, one of the landowners where I used to hunt, it's sold since he did exactly that. Went out, but this was in the red light days, bought the red light, blah, blah, blah. Didn't call one after two nights and never went back. So, <laughs> so it does happen. What the percentage is, I don't know, but it'd be interesting to look that up in the future. Well, I know something that inf influences that out where I'm at, you know, here in Western Nebraska with, with our coyote fur is worth good money on the years that the fur market's up. Right. You know, and about three, four years ago, the fur market was really crazy just right during COVID, right, right after COVID. Um, you know, so guys were getting 50 to 80 bucks on the carcass for a coyote. Well, oh, obviously man. that spurred a lot of guys, right? Everybody was going to be right. coyote hunters at that point. Well, I'm going to go buy this, this, and this. I'm going to go, I can justify spending 5,000 on a thermal because I'm going to go kill a hundred coyotes and pay it off, you know? Right. And then the very right. next year, the coyote market dropped to pretty much nothing. And now all of a sudden, nah, they're not so worried about hunt coyotes anymore because they're not worth right. money, you know? So Yeah, no, it's, it took a big dip. And I don't know if that's going to come back or not. So um, luckily for me, well, we never really got rich on them here. We would sell them to a fur buyer, but they didn't pay. Like on the hoof, $10, $15 a coyote, five bucks for every fox. You know, and I, cause yeah, I yeah. just didn't have the, the time or the stomach to deal with them. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, it's still low this year again. Yeah. Yeah. So what's, what's the coyote scene in general, like in New York? I know, like you said, you I used to, those the bark at the moon coyote contest. Was that the name of that? Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, it was, you know, well, I, I knew start... I, from back in the, uh, the, uh, oh, what was the online, dang, um, Predator Masters forum. Oh yeah, I always remember yeah. you used to post stuff about that contest and stuff on there. Yeah. Uh, but but you know, I've never hunted upstate New York or even in anywhere part of that, you know, part of the country. So, fill me in on what what's that's like up there. Okay, well, it, it, it's it's great. It's actually getting better because back in the day. I would call in 20 fox for every one coyote. And I would say now that's ratios down to probably one to four. You know, you'll get one okay. for every four or five. Yeah. So the coyotes are getting more prevalent. Are the uh, fox numbers where... dropping? Well, you that's say? funny. I, no, I, no, the coyotes are on the influx, except for last year. Lad, this is crazy. It makes no sense. I can't figure it out, but get a load of this one. In my spots, and I've been doing this since hardcore, since, you know, the late 80s. And my best spots, this is funny because I, I, I don't have a lot of spots to hunt, strangely enough, around my hometown. And I never really try to get new spots and I should. But if I have four or five major farms around my house, I always get red fox off those. So my best spots would always produce. Last year, my best spots, I shot like one fox off of them. So no people kidding. say, well, you killed them all. Well, no, because for 20 <laughs> years, it's replenished. Yeah, so yeah. last year was just bizarre. I can't explain what happened. I still got a bunch, but I had to travel and do some unique, different little setups um, to to make up for that for the number loss. Because I'm a, I like to get a lot of numbers. I like to put out my little videos there and put them on YouTube oh, yeah. and all that. Yeah, right. So because that, that's fun to me. The whole filming thing is fun to me. Uh, sadly, I can't do it in the daytime because I hunt by myself, and so I don't have the equipment for proper, good, yep. you know, quality video. Yep. But I still have a five. Still, to me, it's just a hobby. But, uh, but to answer your question, how is the hunting here in New York? In my area, which is which is representative of most guys what they do in the state, it's agricultural lands. You know, so you're talking cut, harvested corn fields, bean yep, fields, ground, yeah, big, big. Wood blocks is more for up in the Adirondacks. You know, that's hours from us. So we yep. don't, I don't deal with that. You can hunt wood blocks in the, in the mornings and, you know, for, in the daylight. Um, I should do more of that, but schedule wise, I just mostly stick to dusk, dawn, and of course all night. Uh, so that's why my sleep patterns are a little askew, but, um, but it's open, it's open fields. I mean, I see, I was spoiled out West. South Dakota, we can see forever. 
So I try to emulate that in New York as best I can, because I like to see that predator coming from four or 500 yards away. I still get excited. Like I'm 11 years old (laughs) when they come. So I have to calm my breathing and do all that. So I like to see those coyotes coming from a distance so I can prepare myself physically and and mentally, you know, to, to make the, the shot because I don't like to blow it. It's one thing to call in a coyote, but then when you, especially here, if you call one in, you're doing something good, but then to miss at the moment of truth is disheartening. And I hate that with a passion. It ruins my day. And trust me, my wife would know if I miss the night. (laughs) So, but no, I think we all can relate. Oh, I hope so. Because (laughs) uh, you know, I've never claimed to never miss. Now one year, that's just funny with lights before thermal came and I shoot a, Remington 700, 223, um, a little bit custom. My dad was a big gunsmith and always fooling around with guns. But one year, I, I can I, I never missed. I, it was awesome. But I, you know, I got like 35 Red Fox and maybe seven coyotes or whatever. But on yeah, that yeah. particular year, but I would purposely, I wouldn't take any, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take any questionable shots. If they're way out there, I don't want to ruin my, so if they were like 300 yards out there with those old light, I didn't take the shot. But that being said, I went to thermal air a few years ago and that was a big learning curve because I was missing like crazy. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Whoops. But now <laughs> I've, I've got that. There's no excuse. And, you, and then you miss, you think it's the gun. You go to the range, the gun was on. It's like, Oh gee whiz, what happened? But uh, you know, it, it's better now. It's, it's as you know, cause you, you're doing the thermal thing. It, yeah. It's really cool. Yeah. yeah. So, did you yeah. say the well, what, if you had to guess what do you think the your coyote densities per square mile are where you're at you had to take a wild guess 2.1 2. they they're Gee, saying wow. 2.1 huh 2.1 coyotes per square mile in it now new york state has identified certain areas of the state that are better than others sadly for me i don't hunt in those areas it was you know and they're not really they even have but some are really suburban so that i don't know how much that counts but yeah, uh, yeah. One's a suburban suburban town where I don't think anybody really could hunt. Ironically, I am the predator guy for my town. They wanted to pay me to hunt. And I said no, because they were at number one, the guys are my friends. They we had a meeting one day, went in, they talked about it. They go, Okay, now how much are you gonna charge us? And I looked at them, I said, I'm not gonna charge anything. I'm just glad to help out. Well, here I am hunting on soccer fields. Oh, it's oh, yeah. awesome. <laughs> oh, it's great. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And the ironic thing is, even though some of them are in town, when I shoot, no one, and that's this is no, no can, no, you know, no silence around there, whatever the case may be, no one ever hears me shoot. It's it's awesome. And you know, and of course you gotta still abide by the rules as far as being away from a building and all that, but but still it's it's right there. It's, yeah, it's yeah. suburban at its closest, shall we say. But that's that's been really fun too. Um that's I unique, you know. To... I, I'm always curious about coyote densities. You know, I think I always feel, you know, you've been out west, okay? So I feel like everybody, you know, watches the videos, right? All the videos started out west, right? So mm-hmm. for the most part, and they see that, and they're like, "Oh my god, you guys are just covered up with coyotes out there." They're like where I'm at, I don't know if we even have a 2.1 coyote density per square mile in some spots. You know, it's it's yeah. unique the concepts are unique you know you've been out west and east you know the challenges that each each have their own challenges you know what i'm right. saying mm-hmm. um what, here, what would you say the biggest challenge is in new york obviously probably land access is probably your, a, a huge challenge right um would that be would, would you consider that your number one challenge it's one the number one uh you can get the land a lot of guys save it for deer and well it's funny everyone's going to leasing now Yep. Leasing the land, which is sort of a bummer because I much prefer the old handshake and buy them a gift certificate for dinner. Yeah. But there, there's a lot of leasing. So gating land, but assuming you have the land, the challenges for hunting here are number one, hunting where there's coyotes, because this is weird. One of my leases, I do get a few, I get like four average, four a year off one farm. But if I go two miles away to one of my buddy's leases, there's coyotes all over. Like you'll see them every single night. So it's, it's being, so the challenge is being where the coyotes are. And that yep. is probably true for any game species, Turkey. Let's face it. Yep. Hunt is great. If you have a good spot, Yeah. but if you're, your spot's not that good. And sometimes it's hard to get a good spot. Sometimes the spots look great. 
but nothing produces. So I would say that's a challenge. I would say pressure from other guys because there's times here when you're hunting and I can hear the gray fox distress down the road blaring away. <laughs> oh, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah, especially yeah. On, yeah, especially on contest weekend. We used to get that a lot. But even now, and I know those guys and a couple of my friends, so it's okay. It's okay. But <clears throat> Sometimes I'll go with my buddies to other spots, like a little down south of Rochester. Here I am. And the guys are wrecked. You can still, back in the day, see, well, still, you see red lights. You hear the howling. It's like, oh, gee. It's sort of discouraging. Because I don't like, I want to be out there by myself, you know? Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, so that's a challenge. But I would say another big challenge for here is the fact that they're, if the, the fields are smaller, those coyotes will get in the woods and not come out and not commit. And that's a huge issue everywhere I know. And that's one of the golden questions. Well, the coyotes are scolding us, but they won't come out. What can I do? And so that's that happens quite frequently also, which is a whole nother ball of wax and how to deal with them. But but that the, those are the main things and the whole daytime issue. Because in our area, like of all those coyotes I shot, so if I get 50 coyotes a year, Two or three are in the daylight. It's all at night. And I make a lot of empty stands, but I'm okay with it. Because my motto is, I'd rather go hunting on a nice morning for an hour. Because I lose my confidence after about an hour. If yeah, nothing yeah. shows up, it's at least I can say, well, it's at least I went. They didn't come this time. They might next time. Whatever. I'm okay with it. I just like to go. Um, unless I'm trudging through 12 inches of snow on the ground. Then, then I don't go. And that's not fun. Um, but... Uh, but that that's really what it amounts to. It's, it's being in an area where the coyotes are at, I would say, is the is the number one obstacle. That's that's a unique, you know, from guys from the east, you know, I consider where you're at the east. I mean, I think there's some, you know, I even consider eastern Kansas east for me, you know, because to okay. me, once you get about there, you know, train really doesn't look much different. Honestly, if you've been through Iowa and Indiana and Illinois all the way to your at, it's the same thing. It's a lot of ag, broke ground, right, right, you know, little right, pockets right. of timber and creek bottoms and stuff. I mean, it seems like, you know, obviously you get big pockets of timber in the east in certain spots right. and things like that. But really, to me, there's dirt roads about every damn mile, you know. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, very similar, sure. you know. So when I tell people eastern Kansas east, a lot of the eastern guys look at me and roll their eyes. And I'm like, well, really, it, it's pretty similar, honestly. You right, know, as opposed right. to when getting out, when you get out to South Dakota and you have a, a 10,000 acre chunk of ranch and there's a couple two tracks right. through it, right? I mean, that's right. the, the big difference. Um, I always think of that when I drive to South Dakota across that river, and I should know the name right now, out by Chamberlain or whatever. Oh, yeah. Then yep, it, coming down out of here. Yep. Yeah. West then River, East River. Then you're out west. Then yeah. you're out yeah. I love That's my favorite area of the country, by the way. That whole Rapid City, Mount Rushmore, Black Hills, Badlands. Yeah. Oh, my. Yeah, so I'm just I like I'm that. just like three hours. I'm three hours south of Rapid City is where okay. is where I live. So so yeah, okay. I'm very familiar with all that country. Yeah, but you know, you made a good point with the Eastern stuff, where guys, you know, they give up on the day hunting, right? Um, because the the success isn't as much. And I wonder a lot of times, you know, I talk about I talk about transition area type stands, and and bedding area type stands a lot, and you know. On our conversation last night, I was telling you I kill just as many coyotes in the middle part of the day as I ever do early and late, you know. Um, and I wonder, do you think that's an issue where, you know, you talked about wanting visibility, right? Like that's mm -hmm. just when you go out west and that's what you see. So to me, that's one of those – that's kind of like a transition area type stand where you have a little bit of visibility, usually on a field edge of some kind, you know, right. timber. Um do you think any of that to, has to do with that where guys aren't willing to really get in where the coyotes are during that daytime hour? Because obviously your visibility is way limited. Um, and then, like you said, the coyotes are coming to the edge of that cover. They're not wanting to break ground like they do at night or maybe early, right. early morning or late in the day. So they stay back in there a little bit. So maybe you're calling in some coyotes that you never see. Um, I don't know. what What's your take on that? Well, my take is this, uh, good and back to the guys. And I know, cause I talked to them at the, at the contest and what, throughout the year on the message board and all that, they don't hunt in the daytime here because they go at night and they say to themselves, well, if I don't get them at night, I'm not going to get them in the day. Say so they don't even try. They don't try yeah. to, 
adjust setups or tactics because uh, money, the, the fur is not worth it. Yeah. It's not worth their effort. They're working. Don't forget their, yeah. their work oh, jobs. Yeah. They may be busy on the weekend. That's uh, it amounts to that. If they have to pick and choose their time, they're going to pick the or to justify their thermal purchase. They're going to go at night yeah, yeah. versus the day. Now, someone like me can go all the time now, fortunate. And I do go back and substitute school every once in a while, but I can pick and choose. Um, or they're deer hunting too, don't forget, in the daytime. Deer hunting's huge here in the Northeast, like ridiculous, hugely huge. Oh, yeah, and I yeah. do it too. But I just think it's a lack of confidence on their part. And that's it. And I would never knock anybody. I would say, and myself included, but I, I still go and I should go more. Last year, I didn't do a whole lot of daylight because I was busy, but, and I want to, I've got some buddies out there go at noon and you were telling me they're the high noon. And, and even now in the summer, I can't imagine, but they're, they're still getting them. So, and that's the sign of seeing that stuff on Facebook should motivate other guys to go do it. Um, but your question, why don't they? I, I just think it's because they're not confident and they just would much rather go at night because they see more. That, that's that's what it is. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's just. And, uh, you also mentioned Jeff about you, you mentioned about guys maybe calling in and not seeing them. I heard the stat years ago, and I believe it. For every coyote we call in, there's five more you call in, but you never see here in the east. In some parts, I would definitely believe that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You know, due to, due, due to wind and terrain and uh, yeah, vegetation. That's sort of wild. Because you go to a beautiful looking spot and you say, "How can we not call anything in here?" Well, yeah. you might have. You just don't know it because you never know where they're. Gonna, you know, there's a few absolutes in this game. Yeah. Um, and if you can set up to see downwind and all that, but sometimes they don't come in downwind. They might be, be you know, be in another location where you can't see them. So, so that's an interesting stat, shall we say? You know, when I go when I go to Rick's there in Eastern Kansas, and we'll go out at night, and it'll be a night where just for whatever reason the coyotes are just ripping, howling like crazy, right? Very vocal that night. And you'll hear like six, seven, eight coyotes within a mile almost every time you set up. And you're like, I mean, I think the coyote densities in that country are like five, six, seven coyotes a square. I mean, I that's pretty six, wild. Yeah. But then, yeah. you know, then we go day hunting, you know, and you'll kill one on a stand, maybe nothing. And you're like, I know there's like five or six coyotes in this section. Like, but, yeah. not, you know, like, did well, they show up? Did we not see them? <laughs> you know, it always makes you get you scratching your head when you yeah. leave. You know, yeah. and, uh, here's my <laughs> motto of speaking as ponderings while you're in the in the field there yeah. to me, because we get a lot of fox and our motto used to be see and back with the days of lights. We had a motto eyes in every field. Every time we went hunting, we expected to see eyes come and now they might when you're not come in or whatever. Yeah. But, but uh, with these, with the coyotes and them not showing up, it makes, when you do get one, it seems like it's too easy. Here comes a coyote at <laughs> 7.30 in the morning, running across to whatever rabbit sound, and you blast them at 75 yards. Why doesn't that happen all the time? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Why can't it be like this all the time? <laughs> I, I, I often, you're staring down at this thing that looks like a wolf. Number one, I can't, I'm, I look at them. And I can't believe it's roaming around in somebody's house is 400 yards that way. And this is basically yeah. this junior rule, you know, we shouldn't say, probably say wolf these days because in New York, they're trying ready. For, you haven't heard about the New York rules. You're going to love this. Readers might enjoy this uh, across the, uh, the nation here. I'll share this tidbit of now of superior wealth from New York state <laughs> upcoming season. Ready, Jeff? If you shoot a coyote, this is on the books, the assembly bill. If you shoot a coyote that weighs, 50 pounds you have to take it to the dec for dna analysis now if too many coyotes are checked in in an area that weigh 50 pounds you can't hunt there anymore oh my because, gosh because they're trying to save all the wolves that are running around new york state now just think about that it's insane it's it's completely bonkers i know so, some people are saying like well goddamn 50 pound coyote i mean out west, 50 pound coyotes unheard of, but where you're at, that's right. not very uncommon, well, is it? Well, I can give you some stats on that. Luckily, you know, my biggest ever was 53 pounds, but that was a female shot in late March. Okay. End of story on that. But I've been running that Fox Grove Bark at the Moon coyotes for, for the past 20 years. 
I think in 20 years with the big dog contest, the guy would pay the extra five dollars to get in. And I I want to say there was two coyotes over 50 pounds. It was really? one so was not 50, very many. No, one was 56. My my buddy from downstate shot it, Matt Dixon. It was like 56 pounds, and it honestly looked like a werewolf with long guard hairs. It, was, it had it must have had a little mange. They had long guard hairs coming off. It looked like something in a, a horror movie, and he got it mounted to it, from what I understand. Jeez. But 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 the big ones are like 48, 49. That's what yeah. it would take to win. Maybe 45. Oh yeah, if you get 45 and above, that's a big coyote. Last year I posted on the on the board, let's have a 50 pound club. Well, nobody got in, myself included. You know, so but I'm not saying what well, you hear people, oh, so and so got a 68 pounder. Sure. <laughs> you know? Yeah, let's double check your scale. Yeah, let's check the scale. What you know, but that, that's like that's like fish too. You know, if you get one, be happy for the person. Yeah. Uh yeah, that's that's really what amounts to. And of course, color phases are a whole nother issue because I don't get the most coyotes, but I gotta say I get some awesome looking creamsicle orange oh yeah. not not the pure black thank goodness for my wallet but yeah. i've got some real dark ones mounted there with those funny ones that look like it's some sort of shepherd i've got some i will say i got some cool coyotes i got one that's a little female she only weighed like 24 pounds but she was just really dark brown and black she's mounted at the house yeah i up here you get some great colors. yeah i am jealous of you guys out out in that country that get that kind of cool Call them muck coyotes. What I mean, everybody calls them color phases. Am yeah. I off from calling them muck coyotes? Just go with color phase to be safe. But Jeff, I'm jealous of your beautiful, fluffy coyotes out that I see on your videos. I'm like, oh man, <laughs> those are gory because they're okay. So here they're either gray and drab and boring, or they're a crazy color phase. So when I shoot, because at night you seems can't tell with the thermal, of course. Yeah. So yeah. when I walk up at night, they're see black. They're all black, right? white but when i walk up on one I, and it's normal gray i go oh thank god no i don't have to get it mounted because i don't like to waste <laughs> anything i've got a whole bunch mounted in my house <laughs> it's, it's bad no good because <laughs> they're all because they're cool i'm not gonna yeah, waste yeah. that and i'm not and i'm not a fan because last year no about five years ago i shot one that's real dark and it was big it was a great story but I didn't have the thousand dollars to mount at that time to mount it. So I got one of those, you know, skinned it out and had it taken, you know, tan. Yeah, tan, yeah. And it's in my it's in my basement. I'm not a fan. Now I wish I would have. And that's great if you like it. But people, you know, for space and room and finances, which was my situation too. But now I wish I would have had that thing on a full mount. I'm all about the full <laughs> mount for anything. Turkey, just like, yeah. So but yeah, uh, with color faces are cool. And I enjoy seeing them on Facebook. These guys. Oh, I got three, and they're all black. I'm like, oh my god, look at that! That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's wild. That's yeah, wild. That's great. <laughs> when you first started going out west, being an eastern kind of coyote hunter, what were some of the challenges that you were surprised when you got out uh, west? You're like, wow, I don't. I, this, I thought this was going to be easier. This aspect of it was there a certain aspect of it that you were like, damn, this is this is way more challenging than I thought. This, I can answer this, but my answer is in reverse. This is sort of cool. Again, dad and I in the 90s started going out there and we would have a boom box at that time, like a, a you know, a, a rock and roll boom box for okay, playing yeah. cassette, cassette decks. decks. Yeah. And then, yeah, cassette, yeah, cassette thing. That's the word. And then with a whatever, I can't, don't Johnny Stewart tape, whatever yep, the Johnny cassette tape tapes. Was. Yep. And we would put in there, the two of us hit that tape no matter what kind of day, 95 degrees, rented white minivan in sight and here came the coyotes so like, you were going out awesome. in the summer because you were shooting prairie dogs yeah exactly yeah, and, then, and then hunting teacher. some coyotes yeah oh and yeah I summer off. Yeah. Before, yeah i had to go before yeah. labor day so it was late august and one time we went antelope hunting the uh, lyman wyoming in an early season with the rifle okay. and i shot my first antelope out there but these coyotes are coming in like crazy and if you and even if you didn't kill so well, we did kill them but you would see a bunch i would see more there in a week than you would in a year here in new york it yeah. was awesome okay now let's fast forward so here i am with all this state-of-the-art equipment and i go out to south dakota and i you know combine it then i go out to colorado i go to colorado on this blm land in the it's daytime of course but dusk and dawn i don't see a coyote i don't hear a coyote I'm like what is going the same spots 20 years ago we used to wreck them i used to sit i do it on purpose sit right there with my dad and get yeah. the, i go there now nothing so i'm almost in shock it's, it's what happened so I, I can't explain it and but 
to the point where I'm not going back this fall. I'm going somewhere else. I'm going to Vegas to see the Beach Boys instead. But mm-hmm. so the challenges out there for me were none because it was so awesome. But now, now if I go to South Dakota on the Rosebud on private land, it's pretty awesome. The, those yeah. all these new pup sounds that came out there a couple of years ago. Coyotes were running every which way trying to figure out what's going on. It, it's really good. It's fun. Yeah. So my yeah, challenge there was con- controlling just my heartbeat and be able to shoot them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know some guys that have come out wet, you know, you know, when where you're at, your your stands are pretty much laid out, right? Like you have this little chunk. Like if if I'm gonna make right, a stand right. here. That's really the only option you have, right? Right. Yeah. I know some That's guys fun. get over they get out west and you can like, well, I can make a stand over there, there, there. Like, where do I even go? Like their eyes get so big and they're like they're overwhelmed with just the vastness of um because as you found, I mean, even like you mentioned, you know, you go a spot of yours might have a few coyotes, but you go up the road two miles and there's more coyotes there for whatever reason. Right. It's right. more different than out here. There's like pockets of coyotes and like trying to figure okay. out like where they're at, you know, and stuff right. like that. Well, that would be the challenge because with limited time, and if I'm out of that BLM, which was unproductive out there in Colorado, there it was up by Grand Junction, it was way out west. Yeah. Um. So my challenge there would be without prior scouting, knowing where to go. But if we went in blind in the past and we're productive yeah. now. It was useless. Yep. It was disheartening, quite frankly. So what's happening here? Yeah, it's all the you new know? coyote hunters out there. But maybe From... education. I, 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 yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what to say. I, no, but you know. <laughs> I'm better for the experience. I, I'm okay with it. What are you going to do? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's better than not going. So, well, I'm sure you're like me. There's nothing better than just, I love going to new spots just to challenge yourself a little bit, right? Like, it's easy okay. to go back to your same spots over and over where you exactly know where you're going to set up and you know kind of where the coyotes are always going to come from if they're here. And, oh, you yeah. Know, have your gun pointed you to a new spot. Corner, yeah. You know, yeah. And you, when you go to a new spot and you got to actually use your brain a little bit and say, like, yeah. okay, here we go. And then it feels like, oh, all right, man, we really right. outsmarted right. them this time because, yeah. you know, you know, and sometimes it's be a little game of cat, game of cat and mouse. Try, like, I've got a, a good buddy here in Rochester. We go to all his spots, which are down south. So every time I go with him, for me, it is just what you're uh, explaining somewhere new. And yeah, and it takes sometimes. It takes just like turkey. Sometimes it takes you a couple uh, mornings to figure out those oh, turkeys. Yeah, yeah. a couple nights, a couple nights with the coyotes. And yeah, that's the the good part of it. You wouldn't want to be stagnant. We can't be stagnant in what we're doing. I, I suppose, oh, I suppose, yeah, yeah. To, to overall, I'm sure there's guys who just go out there with a mouth call and a rabbit call and have success all the time. You know, more power to them. But whenever you, and I write about this, and that's great. I mean, if I could do it, I guess I would probably uh, ex- accept that. But if you do experience lulls in your productivity, for sure, try something new. That's what yeah. it's all about. That's where I'm coming from. Yep. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah. So the last thing I want to leave listeners with, you and I, so actually you and I were on a phone call last night. You're working on a couple articles coming up for Predator Extreme that you wanted my input on a little bit. So we had a good conversation mm-hmm. last night and we got to talking about moon phases a little bit. And it's not something that I've really never, I don't know, if, maybe we have on, on previous podcasts, but so moon phases, obviously you get a lot of questions about it. I get a lot of questions about it. So this article coming out, what's going to be the gist of of the moon phase and and how guys can use it or don't use it, don't care about it, care about it, whatever, whatever they, yeah. however they want to look at it. Okay. Well, without giving all the, the stats and uh, the crux of the article away, I can surely say this, that nighttime hunters have definite opinions about the moonlight, the bright moon, because uh, there's eight moon phases. We don't get into that because that is like going back to science class. Waning, I had to research. Us- yeah, oh, yeah. I'd be, I'd be crazy. Waning, waxing, this and yeah. that. So anyhow. And I got some neat stats on that. So it's going to be another worthwhile article. But the guys who are out there, and I did a national survey. It's just not New York State. Uh, there's a national survey out there now, and it's on Facebook. If anybody wants, just check me out. You'd see it. But it's not a big deal. I was just gathering data. Guys who go out at night on a moonlit night, 90% of the guys don't like a moonlit night versus a new moon or, or no moon showing, okay, for a variety of reasons. So the idea is what strategies can you use to help you on a, a moonlit night? And basically it's using some sort of shade, not sitting out in the open, right? right? Because on a dark night, I'm a field hunter at night. I sit right out in the open. 
Now, yes. if there was a tree there, I would use it, but I have no qualms on it. And I wear camo and try to blend in all that. Um, I have no qualms about being where I can see. Dad taught me that way back when with all hunting. Yeah, yeah. Make sure you have a vantage point and you can make a manageable shot. But on a moonlit night, if you're standing out there, you increase the opportunity for them to see you, obviously. Okay. Uh, this came up years ago too. Well, it's dark. They can't see you. Well, a predator, fox or coyote, sees differently to us. They can see in the, nut, the dark a lot better, okay, due to the structure of their eye. But still, you can do things to hide, and using shade is going to be hugely important, whether it's a hedgerow, a tree, a rock pile, a piece of farm equipment in our case, a little ledge to put on your, on your terrains, something, so they don't skyline you, because you will stand out. Don't forget, you're in, you're in their, their house, their living room at that point, yeah. and they do pick it out. And it happens to everybody. It's not going to be perfect. But that would say that, and I would also say, for me, it's getting, they'll say, oh, they won't want to cross this big open cut bean field or whatever, for whatever reason, even though at night. So get closer to the cover where their prey species are. Because don't forget the prey species, mice, rabbits, and moles and such, they're not exposing themselves. Studies have shown this, and I allude to this in the article. I don't allude, I pointed out what are the research they are. Those prey species alter their behavior on a moonlit night too they're not traveling as far they're only using vegetation their time of movement's different it all changes with the moonlight it changes that prey species behavior and that hence changes the fox and coyote behavior now they're only going where those prey species are so we as hunters may have to move 300 400 yards closer so they might yeah, pop yeah. out of the vegetation enough for a shot but they may Nah, no, no absolutes. We've all had, I've shot Kyle or Fox at 300 yards running across a moonlit field with no lights at night. You can see them so good. So I'm not saying they will, can't happen, right? There's yeah. no absolutes. But to increase your consistency, you might want to move closer to where those predators would be. That's through, for a couple of examples. Through those surveys, does it seem like a lot of guys um, take into effect moon phase as far as what their success is? is going to be or not going to be based off of the moon phase. Like guys are really diving deep into that to say, well, should I, wow. I shouldn't even go out tonight because during this moon phase, my success has always been really crappy, you know, or I'm going to wait and go out when it's this. Did, did you get some data on that? Yes. And guys, some guys now don't hold me to percentage because it's changing with the more people. Yeah. See it. Some yeah. people will not hunt a full moon. They will. So, yeah, so, some guys who are hardcore, like me and, uh, yeah. and tons of go no matter what, right? Go when you can. There's other yeah, go when you can. Yeah, but moon. But some guys who are picking it, picking their nights, won't go on a full moon because, as you say, they don't do as well, quote unquote. So they'll go on a dark moon. Some guys plan their hunting trips uh, regard uh, in regard to what the moon phase is. But uh, and, and that's the concept. That's a conception, a blanket statement. But in talking to people in preparing this article, now the guys I'm talking to are hardcore guys such as yourself. They go out as often as they can, no matter what. So factors like wind speed and precipitation and maybe even temperature, but that's probably down on the list too, because we've all frozen out there and you're sweated too, you know, extremes. Those are the factors that are more important. For me, it's wind. I mean, for me personally, I don't this, I don't put me in the article, my viewpoints hardly, but if it's a full moon, bring it on. That's cool. That's cool to be out there. That's a great experience. If you don't get anything, who cares? At least you're out there on an awesome night, right? If, um, so th that's my motto. And then a dark night. So Now, with the lights, I will say the dark nights were better because you see better. With thermal, it doesn't matter so much. But, <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, I love it all. I love it all. But to answer your question, for sure, guys do that. And in the stats and in, in this, I'm trying to think real quick. I haven't looked at it in about a week. So I'm working on another fun project here. But uh, yeah, they, it's a preponderance of the guys who hated, hate the full moon. Like 90%. You know, I think, I think a, a lot of it to me is the guys that are transferring over that were deer hunters or probably deer hunters mostly that are coming over to the game of coyote calling. You know, I think let's just take a look at deer hunting, right? If you're a if you're a tree stand hunter, all right for deer, mm -hmm. do, I think the moon phase would affect that because it affects the deer movement, right? 
to some extent. Yep. There's probably all kinds of research on that. Right. Yeah. Right. And if you're sitting in a tree stand, you are totally relying on the deer moving, right? If the deer aren't moving right, right. there during daylight hours, you're not going to get a shot with your bow. Right. right. Plain and simple. Right. Well, I think guys try to take that same concept and want to, want to parallel it over to coyote hunting when it's just a little bit different that's fine if does the moon phase affect coyote movement i'm sure it does to some extent right you know we talked about the size of you and i were talking about the bubble size of a coyote and i've talked about this right. on the podcast a lot before you know it's this imaginary circle around a coyote and depending on a, a variety of a hundred different factors that bubble could be small or big and, and the size of the bubble is really the distance that coyote's willing to move at that particular point in time and but even though if a coyote's bubble is very, very small and you set up within that bubble to call that coyote, you're still going to call in that coyote, you know? So I think there's, that's the, the parallel or the, not really the parallel, but the difference between guys wanting to compare coyote hunting to, you know, deer hunting, you know, waterfowl right. hunting even too, you know, how are the, the birds leaving the water and coming out to the fields? Uh, you know, there's a variety of things right. you can compare it to, but, but yeah, I think that's what, that's what guys get wrapped up in, I think, and and they want to spend a lot of time thinking about it, and it's not as big a factor as I think some guys make it out to be. Well, that last statement right there is sort of summing things up with this, because when I got into this article, because it was a neat idea, again, the idea, yeah. but when I, I, when I did my research on it, because I assumed just I'm going to find out how this truly affects coyote movement and hunting uh, response and success and all that. And I'm, and I'm, I'm halfway in, so it's not concluded yet, yeah. but by the number one, the research on coyote movement is conflicting. Some research studies show more increase in a full moon, some show less. So right there, and I'm at about 50% right now. So we're, you know, oops, <laughs> that, that, that's, yeah, not yeah. Definitive. <laughs> that's not definitive. The prey thing is pretty co constant. The relationship to prey and, and predators is, is constant. So that part's fine in tune. Um, but in talking to the guys, they're not, I'm not account. And I thought they would more. No one in the predator world is like you say, jumping on as a deer hunter. Would. They're not saying, oh my gosh. Um, or during a high, you know, during a full moon or when the moon ri rises and all, we get some the nice observations about that, but it's not like, oh, if the moon is full tonight, then tomorrow at two o'clock, that's when you want to be coyote on. I have not found that yeah. at all. I <laughs> trust. And I thought I was, I thought, and maybe I still will, cause I've got more work to do. Okay. But that's not leading to that. And it's leading to what you said, just go, you go yeah. when yeah. the conditions are right and your schedule allows and, and, and do it. And get where the coyotes are. It's probably we talked about that a little bit. Yeah. Um, so regarding the moon, I mean, I can't give it all away because there's some cool stats no. and Heck it's no. cool for guys to think about. But I was a little shocked that I didn't get more precise. I'm not done. So yeah. Well, like <laughs> yeah. you asked me about it, you know, I want in my limited thermal. I mean, I thermal hunt a lot, but it's not near as much of what most guys do with their thermals. But it seems to me at night that the new moon when it's real world dark i have less coyotes come running to the call whereas in a full moon i feel like the coyotes run to the call more faster I mean, it, and you know me my style anybody listen to this my style is fast and furious i'm covering ground let's just we're, we're keen on very specific coyotes and let's go kill as many as we can in a in a certain period of time so i want coyotes running to the call not diddy bopping walking taking their time 30 minutes to get you know 500 yards to me no i don't yeah. want that and i wonder too is it just is it several things a the coyotes can't see as well so they don't want to run because they can't see cactus they can't see holes and you know the terrain as well so they just don't want to run across it or is it to the fact that their senses when it's a when there's no light they can't see as well either so they almost feel like they're at a disadvantage um, to some extent, even though they can see at night. Obviously, they can see better on a full moon than they can with no moon, right? Right, um, right. So, yeah, I, don't, I, I just wonder that, too, sometimes, that, uh, that maybe that's part of it. But once again, that's just based <laughs> off a few handful of small situations right. that I've seen. Well, it's a neat concept and idea and one that needs further investigating. Because, yeah. you know, truly, why wouldn't they? there's very various reasons why they wouldn't run on a dark night but yeah it needs 
it needs looking at. It's funny because out here, of course, I need now, even after doing this article, when I go hunting this this year, I'll have to note of how they respond because we get our response rate and behavior here in New York is so variable, so variable. Sometimes they'll, like you say, they'll sit there and stare at you for 20 minutes. Well, what in the world? Well, next time they have is I'll look up and see what the moon is. I haven't been given it much consideration. You know, yeah. I just, I'm just happy to see a coyote. But yeah, yeah that I'm gonna do. I'm gonna log that moon stuff out next year, just this coming season, just for fun. Because, like I say, sometimes my gosh, they'll walk, they'll saunter, they'll go away and come back. It's like what in the world? Commit, you know? Yeah, and they do. Yeah. They do come, but and then of course you, you do get the hard chargers too. So I'll I'll try to take note. But here in New York, even if it's a full moon, half the time it's so cloudy you can't tell it's full. Oh, yeah. and, and, <laughs> so there you go. Yeah. So you just, like I say, it doesn't. <laughs> that's that's why it's not wind is my big thing. Wind and rain and snow. Yeah. Because we get a lot, we get a hundred inches here, so half the time. Oh yeah, yeah. There's sometimes like in February you can't even hunt because the snow's so deep. Like on this, can't park your car, can't park in somebody's driveway. It's you're you're grounded yeah. more or less just due to weather. So well, but we're looking. We're not done with the moon yet, no. Jeff. We're, we're going to stay on this for a bit. Right now, the moral of the story is kill them when you can kill them. You know, the hunt when you hunt when you can. <laughs> right, right. I'm seriously. Yeah. And then and then look at the details. That's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna hunt this year and I'm gonna look at the details during <laughs> and after and not worry about it so much. Oh, well, heck yeah, man. Well, buddy, I'm gonna let you get going. I'm gonna uh wrap this sucker up. I know you got family coming back to the cabin for yeah for the day. Yeah. So really appreciate yeah. you taking the time to jump on. This has been fun, man. Yeah, oh, my pleasure. Great chatting. Thanks for if, having uh, me on. If, if if anybody was wanting to pick up one of your books, um, what what would be the best best place for them to find that? Yeah, real simple. Amazon.com. Just put oh, in. Yeah. Yeah. Easy enough. Amazon. Just Kyle, I'm sure it'll pop right up there. Yeah, it was number you can one. Just search the Andrew Lewand and yeah, put Andrew Lewand. It'll pop up. It'll pop up. We got a bunch of hunting books on there. And Are you got one on of the audio books yet or what? You know what? I don't. I thought oh. about that. It's Kindle. It is on Kindle. Oh, it's on Kindle? Okay. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And here's an interesting tidbit for whatever, whatever this is worth. My two best selling books are my shortest books in page count which I, I you know i don't know what there is about that you yeah. know they're but, but whatever it's just like videos they say for you know a lot of guys like a short video to watch and whatever but uh but, oh, but yeah, there's a sweet spot there they're, they're, i know and i haven't even figured that out but my yeah. my little videos are just for fun it's just you know, they're they're on there too that's on youtube they're they're <laughs> comical but yeah, yeah no the books just amazon and you know i appreciate everybody who's who's gotten them in the, in the in the kind words and reviews really that's what it's all about people like oh them. yeah yeah They're terrible then it'd be the disheartening but uh it's been great and, and i enjoy it and i enjoy you know talking about the hunt and, and this has been really fun jeff it's always fun talking to you it's bringing me back i remember sitting with you again back in ohio like it was yesterday sitting here talking so that's cool <laughs> yeah I'll tell you what we'll see if we can find that picture and we'll make it the uh I know. If, if we can find it, we'll make it the cover picture to this podcast. Oh okay. You know, right. people can check yeah. out the picture when yeah. they, when they listen to it, you know? Well, you get, okay. Well, I'm going to go home next Wednesday. I'll have I bet to you I don't have I... any gray in my beard. I'll bet you that, you know, <laughs> we were babies back then. <laughs> <laughs> All right, buddy. Listen, I, enjoy. All right, Andrew, I appreciate you jumping on. I appreciate everybody listening. Uh, you know, appreciate you guys making this number one predator hunting pos- podcast out there. Without you guys listening, this just wouldn't be possible. And also, got to thank the sponsors that make this possible. We have Swagger Bipods, Sig Optics, Onyx Hunt, Lucky Duck Predator Calls, Silencer Central, Hornady, Cryptech, and of course Eatsman's. Putting this all together and bringing it to you guys. Go check out everything they have to offer there at their website, which is Eastmans.com. So until next time, stay cool, and we'll catch you right here on the Eastmans Predator Pros Podcast. <laughs>